Good morning, everyone. Our scripture this morning is taken from uh, the, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. I'm reading from the fourth chapter, and as always, I invite you to keep your Bibles open to that uh, as we look uh, more closely at, at certain of the, of the verses. I'm in chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 13 through 25. Listen now to the Word of God. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to, to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abraham believed hope against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And that is why his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. But the words it was reckoned to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. May God add to our understanding of that reading from God's Word. Amen. Have you ever known someone who is skilled in the art of guesstimation? People with these gifts come in many different forms, don't they? People with this ability just know within a minute or two what time it is without ever looking at a clock. Others who have this gift can look at something and just know how heavy or how tall or how far away that something is. I have a friend who works at a lumber yard, and if I tell him the dimensions of something being built, he just knows in his head how many boards it'll take, almost to the foot, and how much it'll cost, almost to the penny. There's an old word we hardly use anymore that's used to name what this gift is, and the word is reckoning. Now, the word reckoning has two different meanings. And the meaning that is usually attached to that word means to settle accounts. It's where one party figures out the cost and the other satisfies it. And there are some places in the Bible where such a financial metaphor is used to describe God's modus operandi. For example, there are places in the scriptures that describe God's saving work as settling accounts where humanity's sin has run up a debt to pay, but our collective pockets are empty. And so Jesus picks up the tab. And in verse 3 of this fourth chapter, there is a verse that uses the word reckoning, 
And that verse shapes the whole rest of the chapter we're looking at this morning. And so in order to get the gist of this chapter, we have to deal with that third verse so that we can understand the rest of it more clearly. And the verse says, this is verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the issue is that if we employ the reckoning to Abraham as settling accounts, then this verse would be suggesting that God determined his righteousness based on how much faith he had, based on how vital and faithfully he believed God. And the problem with that is then faith is something that I have to achieve. It's something I would be responsible to produce and then live up to all the time. And if that was the only way that my redemption happened, then how does that square with what Paul said later in chapter 6 when he said, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, the answer to that question is found in the primary meaning of the word reckoning in the Greek. Next slide. The primary meaning of reckoning is that it is the de dependable appraisal of something. It's like the gift I was talking about before, and it has two sides to it. Dependable appraisal sees what is and what will be at the same time. For example, my friend's reckoning was able to see all the boards and all the plywood at the lumber yard and the structure that was going to be built with them all at the same time. And if, for example, a reckoning was about getting to a particular destination, it would see both where I am and where I'm headed simultaneously with the best route and the best time all factored in. So, this reckoning, this dependable appraisal that God had of Abraham was the realization that Abraham had faith for the long haul. God saw that his heart was capable of growing more trusting and more faithful all along his journey. In other words, Abraham was becoming a more and more upright follower of God all along the journey, which is the righteousness that God desires for me and for everyone. And that's what Paul was trying to persuade his readers about in verses 14 through 16 of this chapter, when he said, if righteousness is extended to the adherence of the law, then the promise is void. And then Paul goes on to say, for this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise will depend upon grace. All of this is what's amazing about God's grace, isn't it? Grace accepts us as we are, but at the same time, it sees how we will be transformed by its power. It is that characteristic of God's nature that is so comforting, especially when I mess up, right? At the same time, that characteristic is so encouraging because I can count on the fact that I will grow and become more Christ-like as I follow him. And it's that that Paul was talking about in Philippians 2.13 where he said, it is God who is at work enabling me both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. Now I know that's an awkward phrase. But in clearer words, it means that God is actively remaking me so that I'm able to do God's will and also that I will desire to do it. 
It's all about the way that God transforms my heart and then empowers me to live out God's will. So on the surface, Abraham's story is about a holy fool. All on the basis of a dream and a prayer, he packed up his wife and left his comfortable home with no destination or direction in mind. He and his wife were almost 100 years old at the time. And Abraham had this crazy notion that going on this trip would make him a father, even though he and Sarah had literally spent a lifetime trying to have a child together. And still, off they went. And as they say, the rest is history. And what's amazing about all this is the way his story is the stuff of a real human being. This was no fairy tale. All along the way, Abraham came across a hundred good reasons to turn back. And some of the reasons were the kinds of troubles of life, and some were the troubles of his own making. And all along the way, he had a hundred good reasons to suspect that his dream didn't have a prayer. For example, if you know his story, he caved when Sarah asked him to get his heir with her servant, Hagar. And there were plenty of other blunders of, as well. But when we look at his story as a whole, it's clear that much, much deeper than his first reactions, Abraham, like it says in verse 18, hoped against hope that he'd be the father of many nations. And Abraham just kept going on this journey because he had this crazy faith that God would accomplish what he could not. And I think that's what's earned him the honor of being one of our faith's great fathers. Because he trusted God to make good on what he promised. Even when everything else in his life seemed to say it was irrational to believe it. But there's another truth of this story for us. And it is this. Next slide. People of God, this is where the appraising grace of God comes in so clearly. Because Paul sees Abraham in the same way God did, even with all the mistakes he made. For Paul and for God, verse 20 of this chapter remained true. That no distrust made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God. But, he grew strong in his faith, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So Abraham, even with all of his detours, had enough of that deeper faith to keep following God's roadmap that led to his destiny. And that is the kind of faith that is reckoned to me and you as the righteousness, which is the ability to walk upright with God. You know, I struggle sometimes to believe God, even with much smaller problems that Abraham had. And sometimes I struggle to have faith when I see all the larger problems in the world, troubles like death and suffering, greed and evil, hatred and injustice, all these troubles that seem to be built into the way the world is created and all the troubles that we human beings visit on each other. And still, I'm learning that it's okay for my faith to include all the questions. I'm realizing that I keep going on this Christian journey because sometimes I do feel the kind of hope that kept Abraham going. I'm realizing that my faith is a process of learning and relearning what it means to love God and my neighbor and myself. 
What keeps me going is that unexplainable and persistent way that I experience what that old hymn called blessed assurance, even when it makes no sense to have it. I'm learning that faith is not primarily what I say I believe, but it's more about the way that I know God exists and that God loves this world and that God loves you and me. So the question for us this morning, what does this story about Abraham have to say for our lives here in Menden Church? Well, for one thing, trusting God like Abraham did will mean that we will try new things even when we're not sure about the outcome. See, the kind of faith that breaks me out of my comfort zones, trusting that whatever I attempt for God's purposes is worth the risk. Trusting God like Abraham did will mean that I will start reaching out to people who are not here yet and stop waiting for them to come to me. Because the Great Commission requires Christ's church to go and shine and proclaim and teach the gospel to people out there in the world. But the good news is that such faith will make a difference because Jesus said that life in his Holy Spirit is all about losing one kind of life, a life of playing it safe in order to gain a greater life of the adventure that following him is. The good news is that such faith leads to what Jesus promised in John 15, where he said, I appointed you all to go and bear fruit, and abiding in me, that fruit will last. You see, such faith reckons that because Jesus lives in me, because Jesus lives in us as this church, as Paul said in Ephesians 3.20, that's how to him, by the power at work within us, we are able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine so that to him there will be glory in the church. People of God, that is the faith God has in us. And if we give God the room to work in our lives, God will work. And that is nothing less than redemption itself. Thanks be to God. Amen.